And Mark Broom, let's kick things off with a look at the day's headlines. 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympics officially open in South Korea in 10 hours' time. Thousands of athletes from around the world are ready for the opening ceremony. Outside of sports, a lot of big names from the political world are in town. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's sister is set to arrive in South Korea for the Olympics. Could Kim Yo-jong be carrying a personal message from her brother? And could her visit raise the chance for a possible summit between the two Koreas? Plus, Syria's war is reheating. Carnage in the country reaches a new peak as US warplanes kill scores of Syrian government soldiers in airstrikes. The wait is almost over. The 23rd Winter Olympics will officially kick off its three-week run in Pyeongchang with the opening ceremony set to start in 10 hours from now. That's 8 p.m. Korea time, 6 a.m. Uh, Eastern time in the U.S. and noon in London. It's the second time the Olympic cauldron will be lit in South Korea and the first time in 30 years for the country to host the global sporting event since the 1988 Seoul Olympics. They were the Summer Olympics. For more, let's connect to our Iji Won, who's standing by at the Pyeongchang Olympic Plaza for us. So, Ji Won, tell us what we can expect from tonight's opening ceremony. Mark, under the theme Peace in Motion, the uh, two-hour ceremony will see all 92 participating nations walk into the stadium with their national flags held high. Now, that's not to mention the flurry of performances uh, that will showcase the rich culture and history of South Korea. It's also going to be a historic day for Korea in another way, as the two Koreas will be marching in together under the unification flag with two torchbearers, one from each side. Gold medal hopeful bobsledder Won Yun Jong will represent the South, but the bearer for the North has not yet been announced. We will also see a large VIP audience, including President Moon Jae-in, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, as well as the North Korean delegation, including Kim Jong-un's sister Kim Yo-jong. And last but not the least, we will see the 2018 PyeongChang Olympic cauldron lit with the Olympic torch that's been carried around the country for 101 days now, marking the start of the Winter Games. Now, Jiwon, one thing that's been a real concern is the weather because it has been extremely cold even for uh, Korean winter uh, standards. How is the weather looking today there and, more importantly, tonight for the opening ceremony? Mark, it's expected to be mostly cloudy during the opening ceremony. And while the Korea Meteorological Administration forecast the temperature to be on par with or even above the seasonal average, uh, the uh, ranging from uh, ranging between minus two to minus five degrees Celsius, the wind chill factor will make the real field temperature more like minus 10 degrees. And that's pretty cold if we're going to sit still for hours on end. The organizing committee has prepared a winter gear pack consisting of blankets, raincoats and more for the spectators. But those of you who will be coming to watch the ceremony will need to bundle up, wear plenty of layers and certainly bring a hat, scarf and gloves. Uh, that's all from me for now, but I'll be back with more later. Back to you, Mark. OK, thank you very much, Ji Won. And we look forward to speaking to you later as the clock ticks down to the start of the Olympics. Now, seats at the opening and closing ceremonies are normally the hottest tickets in town during the Olympics. But they had a rival this year that pretty much blew them away. Two extremely rare performances by a North Korean orchestra. Over 150,000 South Koreans applied for the mere 1,060 tickets that were up for grabs. Uh, Won Jong-hwan went to the first concert that was held uh, in Kangneung and filed this report for us. An audience of more than 550 people were treated to a unique performance by a North Korean art troupe on the eve of the opening of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in the city of Kangneung. The lucky audience members were randomly selected from a pool of nearly 40,000 people who previously applied for a ticket to watch the troops' first performance in South Korea. I felt sense of cultural similarity regardless of its difference between the two nations, and the overall performance was well structured. 
Although we had a lot of expectations, we really enjoyed the show. We could see that they prepared a lot for this performance. But at the same time, I wish this was just not a one-off thing for the Olympics. I wish the two countries exchanged more after the Olympics. The 140-member Strong Art Troop, otherwise known as the Samjian Band and led by Hyun song arrived in South Korea on February 6. The band is comprised of more than 50 elite musicians known for their diverse repertoire, which even includes songs from U.S. animated movies like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King. Thursday's show at Gangneung Art Center featured popular songs by household South Korean artists such as Lee seon and Shim soo they sang songs which were familiar for us to sing along. I was impressed by Choi Jin Hee's Maze of Love, Arirang, and Everybody Cha Cha Cha. Another widely anticipated performance was that of the so called Borambung Band, a group of talented musicians and all female singers who are known for their colorful performances and are often compared to South Korean K pop girl bands. This marks the first time since 2002 the Pyongyang sent an art troupe to South Korea. It is also the largest North Korean artistic delegation to ever perform on the South Korean stage. Meanwhile, nearly 300 conservative activists held a rally in front of the Gangneung Art Center, some four hours prior the performance. The protest ended without incident. Next, for the Northwest Art Troupe, a trip to Seoul to perform at the National Theater of Korea on Sunday evening just one day after the joint women's ice hockey team's historic first match against Switzerland. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News, Gangneung. Now, also in South Korea for the Olympics, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence meeting with President Moon Jae-in upon his arrival on Thursday. The two sides shared their own ways of dealing with North Korea, adding some extra spice to the clashing perspectives on the best path to take on the regime. The North. Uh, leader, uh, his younger sister, is flying to the south this afternoon, as we've been reporting. Our chief Blue House correspondent, Moon Gon Yong, reports. Welcoming the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence to the presidential Blue House, South Korean President Moon Jae-in took the opportunity to highlight the visit of the North Korean officials to Pyeongchang, what he referred to as Olympic Games of Peace. President Moon credited the allies' close coordination and firm principles for getting North Korea to engage in inter-Korean talks and participate in the Winter Olympics in his country. Although the two agreed that the goal of any opening with North Korea must be denuclearization, there appears to be differences in how they'd like to get there. That the United States of America will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder in our effort to bring maximum pressure to bear on North Korea until that time comes when they finally and permanently uh, and irreversibly abandon their nuclear and ballistic missile ambitions. Despite possible disagreements over how to approach North Korea, Mr. Moon and Pence in one voice echoed that the state of alliance between South Korea and the U.S. is unshakable. Against this backdrop, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister, believed to be around 30 years old, is flying in on a private jet to the South Incheon International Airport later this afternoon, with the rest of the North Korean delegates led by its ceremonial head of state, Kim Jong-nam. The presidential Blue House said President Moon will hold a luncheon with the North Korean delegates, including the first member of the North ruling Kim family, to visit South Korea. South Korea's alpine resort town of Pyeongchang, where the 2018 Winter Olympics kick off later this evening, may be one of the coldest places in this region, boasting well below zero temperatures. But it'll surely be red hot with Moon, Pence and the influential sister of Kim Jong-un in one country at one time. Just maybe, some observers say, even a high-level encounter between the Americans and North Koreans while here enjoying one of the world's major international sporting events. Moon Gonyo, Arirang News, The Blue House. Now, before heading to Pyeongchang for the opening ceremony, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence is set to stop by in Pyeongtaek to visit a memorial for the South Korean warship Chunan, which was sunk by North Korea by a torpedo fired by their forces in 2010. 46 South Korean sailors were killed in what was the deadliest North Korean attack 
in recent years. However, despite overwhelming evidence, Pyongyang denied any responsibility and has refused to apologize. The vice president will also meet a group of North Korean defectors at the site. The schedule is being seen as an effort to show that Washington intends to keep up the pressure on the regime. Meanwhile, another high-profile figure, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, will be arriving in South Korea later today. He will go directly to Pyeongchang, where he will meet with President Moon and hold a bilateral meeting. The two are expected to talk about North Korea and the controversial 2015 deal on the issue of Japan's wartime sex slavery before attending the opening ceremony. The United Nations has granted a North Korean official exemption from sanctions for the Winter Olympics here in South Korea. The lifting of the travel ban comes with the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics set to take place in the coming hours. Lee Sung Jae has this report. The UN committee overseeing sanctions against North Korea formally granted an exemption for Choi Hee, who will now travel with this country's high-level delegation to South Korea. Choi is the chairman of Pyongyang's National Sports Guidance Committee, but also headed the regime's propaganda department previously. He has been on a UN sanctions blacklist since June last year, which banned him from traveling and froze his assets. The official was included in North Korea's Olympics delegation list provided by Pyongyang on Tuesday. Seoul formally requested that the UN allow all members of the proposed delegation to come, saying it will, quote, serve as a timely opportunity to reduce tensions on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. However, the request came at a time when the international community's main policy on the regime is pressure and sanctions and with North Korea showing no interest in giving up its nuclear program. The move opens up the Moon administration to criticism of pandering to Pyongyang, but the potential rewards mean it's a risk Seoul is willing to take. If, through these efforts, steps are made toward North Korea's denuclearization or lead to lasting peace on the peninsula, then for the Moon administration it will be worth it. How they are judged will depend on the gains they make after the Olympics. With the green light given, Che will join other officials in the delegation that will arrive in South Korea on Friday for the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. And with the so-called Peace Olympics just hours away now, world-renowned symbols of uh, peace and the world, the UN chief and Pope Francis have touted the importance of abiding by the Olympic truce during the Winter Games. Park ji Won with the details. In his message this week, the UN Secretary General said all the world gathered in Pyeongchang will be united by the Olympic spirit of solidarity, mutual respect and friendly competition. He said the ideal of transcending political differences for common humanity has even more resonance on the Korean Peninsula adding that the Olympics represents the best of the world's athletic achievements and the best of humanity, he called on all nations to honor the Olympic truce, which dates back to ancient Greece. Last November, the UN General Assembly also adopted a resolution urging all member states to observe the truce throughout the period from the seventh day before the start of the Olympics until the seventh day until the end of the Paralympics. Meanwhile, Pope Francis sent his greetings to the IOC and to athletes and participants of the Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. He said the traditional Olympic truce has special importance this year as the national teams of both Koreas will not only parade under a united flag, but will compete as one team in women's ice hockey. This allows for hope for a world where conflicts can be resolved peacefully through dialogue and reciprocal respect, as sport teaches us to do. He added that he will send his prayers so that the Olympics will be a great fist of friendship and sport for all. Park ji -won, Arirang News. Now, in other news, North Korea forged ahead with a military parade on the eve of the Olympics and footage of 
A said parade was revealed later in the evening on Thursday. Unlike in the past, the regime remained relatively quiet, choosing not to broadcast it uh, live, and foreign journalists were told to stay away. The scale of the parade was also smaller than is usually seen. Our oh Jung Yi reports. On the eve of the opening day of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, North Korea went ahead with a military parade to commemorate its military foundation day. The parade, however, was smaller in scale than usual. Nevertheless, Pyongyang took it as an opportunity to showcase its key weapons and missiles. The Pukuksong-2 missile, an intermediate-range ballistic missile using solid fuel engine, was revealed. Following were the Hwasong-12, Hwasong-14 and the Hwasong-15, an intercontinental ballistic missile, which can fly over 13,000 kilometers, putting the whole continental United States within reach. But new types of ICBMs or SLBMs like Hwasong-13 or Pukuksong-3 were not revealed. Pyongyang's military parade took place for roughly one hour and 30 minutes, just half the time of the previous one in April last year. And unlike in the past, the parade was not broadcasted live. Instead, the regime released the recorded and edited footage of the parade roughly five hours after it ended. Moreover, no foreign press was present at the event. Such downscaled parade follows Pyongyang's declaration that it completed its nuclear weapons program, thus achieving nuclear statehood. Speculations are that the regime is paying more attention to the international community's response and to the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics atmosphere down in South Korea, where on top of its athletes and cheerleaders, a high-level delegation that includes Kim Jong-un's sister Kim Yo-jong will be visiting. Oh jung Arirang News. Now, despite the festive Olympic mood here in South Korea, North Korea is starting to feel the heat from Brussels. The European Union says 11 non-EU members have decided to adopt and implement the bloc's additional measures, including more North Koreans on their sanctions list. Park Jong-hong with the details. Pressure on North Korea to join the dialogue for denuclearization has been raised even further. Countries like Norway, Ukraine, Serbia and Iceland have joined efforts to include on their blacklist 17 North Korean nationals accused of illicit activities, including weapons trading. At the EU headquarters in Brussels on Thursday, the EU's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, welcomed the additional implementation by the non-EU member nations. The show of solidarity comes after the EU, on January 22, took independent action and imposed asset freezes and travel bans on 17 North Koreans for helping Pyongyang avoid UN sanctions in response to the regime's nuclear and missile tests. Many of those sanctioned were identified as North Korean diplomats in Africa and Asia, using front companies to provide coal, arms and other critical supplies to the regime. At present, 137 North Koreans and 64 entities are subject to the EU sanctions. The European Union has been faithfully implementing the broader UN-initiated sanctions and actively encouraging other countries to follow suit. It hopes the pressure will force the North to come to the dialogue table. Park Jong-hong, Arirang News. Russia says it will not carry out an early forced extradition of North Korean workers. Rather, it's going to allow them to stay until the deadline of the end of 2019, that deadline set by the UN Security Council. Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson made the remark on Thursday through local media. The stance is in contrast to earlier reports where the Russian ambassador to North Korea said his country has started to extradite some North Koreans back to their homeland. An estimated 37,000 North Koreans are working in Russia's construction, logging and agriculture industries. They are believed to be earning overseas cash for the North's weapons programs. With the ongoing probe into a corruption scandal linked to former President Imian Bak, prosecutors have raided the headquarters 
of Samsung Electronics and the residence of a former senior company official. Investigators from the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office confiscated hard drives and other materials from the company's main office, including the home of Lee Hak Su, a former group vice chairman. The probe began over suspicion Samsung paid fees to a local auto parts maker, DAS, which is run by the former president's relatives in a U.S. lawsuit. DAS brought the lawsuit against a businessman to recoup its investment in his U.S.-based investment advisory firm. The prosecution is also looking to whether Im Yong-bak used his influence during his presidency to help DAS recover money from the U.S. firm. Now, for a look at stories making headlines around the world, and we are going to start with U.S. airstrikes on pro-Syrian uh, uh, government forces. Thursday's bombing has uh, incensed Damascus, but Washington says it was in self-defense. For more on this and other news, let's turn to our Noah Adam. Uh, so, Adam, this is another rare attack on pro-Syrian forces. Uh, what else is being said by both sides? Well, Mark, Syrian state-run media says the U.S. strikes killed and wounded scores of tribal fighters, calling it a new effort to, quote, support terrorism. It also accused the U.S. of carrying out a brutal massacre and committing war crimes. The country's foreign ministry said it had written to the U.N. Security Council to urge for global condemnation. However, the U.S.-led coalition says it was acting in self-defense, citing a major attack on its allied Kurdish and Arab forces. The bombing occurred in the middle Euphrates Valley in the eastern province of Daya al Zur. The eastern side of the valley, home to an oil field, is controlled by U.S.-backed forces and Syrian government forces are based in the west. Russia, the main ally of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, also denounced the attack. Moscow's defense ministry said the U.S. was more interested in seizing Syrian economic assets rather than driving out the Islamic State group from its last major stronghold. Thursday's conflict is just the latest in a series of deadly attacks in Syria between rival forces that have led to civilian casualties. Now that the common goal of clearing out IS militants from Syria is almost realized, Damascus and its allies have repeatedly threatened war against U.S. troops if they do not leave the country. But the Trump administration says they will be staying put until there is a peace settlement to the wider war that includes a transition away from the rule of President Assad. U.S. lawmakers are pushing to vote on a two-year budget deal that would avert another government shutdown. However, it would add $300 billion to the federal deficit, which angers some Republicans and also leaves the thorny issue of immigration unresolved, which uh, leaves some Democrats unhappy. However, it does, it does include more spending on defense, which would please GOP members close to the Pentagon. Some Democrats in the lower house may also back the bill because it includes funding increases that their party has sought on programs such as disaster relief, infrastructure and health care. Both parties were to enact a deal by midnight Thursday Washington time when a previously agreed one-month spending bill expires. The White House is in hot water over reports that some senior aides to President Trump withheld knowledge of a domestic violence allegation against a top White House staffer. Former Staff Secretary Rob Porter was accused by two of his ex-wives of physical and verbal abuse. He has denied the allegations but resigned on Wednesday. Officials in the West Wing, including Chief of Staff John Kelly, were said to have known about the accusations but did nothing to remove him. They were even reported to have helped him secure his senior position in the White House and defended him when the allegations surfaced earlier this week. But Kelly said he was shocked on Wednesday by what he called the new allegations against Porter, adding, quote, there is no place for domestic violence in our society. Good morning. After days of deep freeze, the nation saw some welcome relief from the cold spell yesterday. And especially those of us in Seoul will enjoy a lot milder high with an expected high at 6 degrees Celsius this afternoon. But dry weather will remain across much of the country, including here in Seoul. And dust levels could also spike in the afternoon. 
and afternoon highs will rise rapidly, and Seoul and Daejeon will get up to 6 and 7 degrees respectively this afternoon, and more clouds will move in as the day goes along. Milder than average temperatures will be short-lived as we'll see readings plunging again on Sunday and Monday. The cold will ease in Pyeongchang as well this afternoon, but the Olympic Stadium where opening ceremony will take a place will have colder readings along with stronger winds. With that, let's take a look at the international weather for beers around the world. Well, a milder weather pattern is on the way for much of the peninsula with cloudier skies on Thursday. Much of North Korea will also notice much higher readings this afternoon. And as for the rest of Asia, Tokyo had a freezing morning at a low of minus 2 degrees, but highs will rise fast under sunny skies. Meanwhile, Sydney and Melbourne will have a similar weather conditions with highs of 28 degrees Celsius. Heading to North America, a winter storm expected to hit the Chicago area. Snow could drop up to 14 inches, and that's over 35 centimeters by the time it ends on Friday night. And as for South America, Buenos Aires will have some welcome rain on Friday, and that's going to bring some relief from the steamy conditions. Taking you to Europe, rain in London will continue into Saturday, so keep an umbrella handy. Lastly, to Africa, Algiers will only have a single digit afternoon high at 9 degrees, so dress warmly. That's all the weather update for now. And that's where we're going to leave the news for now as well. Our next bulletin is coming up at noon Korea time, so until then, goodbye. Tourist has to go through after arriving in.